All right, the part of the chapter in Genesis 18 I want to focus in on is starting there in verse number 11. The Bible reads, Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased, and ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord at the time appointed? I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And what we see here is a story of, of Abraham and Sarah who, you know, God had promised, had made a promise to Abraham years and years and years before that he was going to make, you know, of his seed, he's, he's going to make nations and, you know, the world's going to be blessed and, and all these great promises unto Abraham and they still were childless. And, you know, it got to the point where they took matters in their own hands and, you know, Abraham went in unto their handmaid, Hagar, and tried to fulfill God's, you know, promises through their own flesh, you know, physically, and, and not just relying on God to give them what he promised. And here we see the story, you know, Abraham and Sarah, they were really old. And it says that it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, meaning that she had already gotten past the point physically in her life where she could bear children. I mean, every woman in this earth gets to that point to where they're no longer capable of bearing children. It's impossible. But look at verse number 14. The Bible says, because God hears this. He's like, oh, so you're going to laugh about this? You know, I made a promise to you. You think I'm not going to keep my promise? And he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the title of my sermon this morning is, How Big Is Your God? Because I serve a big God. Amen. Capable, of doing, capable of doing the impossible. Capable of going to a couple here, a godly couple, and saying, you know what? I'm making a promise unto you. I'm going to provide you with a child. And I don't care if it's impossible according to the world. I don't care if it's physically impossible because I'm capable of doing that. Our God, which is what makes him God. Right? God's not just some man. God's not just like you or me that's limited in any way, shape, or form. God's a God that created all the limitations. He created the world as it is. He is so far above his own creation. He is capable of anything. And we need to remember that this morning. Turn, if you would, to uh, Numbers chapter 11. We need to remember how big our God is. There's a lot of things that we deal with. There's a lot of things that we go through. And there's a lot, of, there's a lot in our life that, that may be obstacles, that may be problems, we may have desires of our heart, and you might say, well, I'm not even going to worry, you know, I can't even ask for that because that's impossible. Well, don't think that way. Not with our God. Amen. How big is your God? My God's big enough to preserve His Word, to keep His Word around. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, you know, with the Bible translations and it's copy of a copy of a copy has been translated into so many languages, you know, like as if the English version wasn't directly translated from the Greek and the Hebrew. But um, it's been translated into so many languages and all sorts of, you know, there's, there's too many problems. There's no way that we could have the Word of God in its, in its entirety and, and perfect without any mistakes. Well, you know what? My God's capable of doing that. He's capable of preserving His Word. In fact, He promised to do that in Psalm 12. He said the, word, the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. If God is in charge, if He is tasked with preserving something do you think he's going to fail at that and just be like, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, I just have these imperfect men. How in the world can I ever use these people to keep my word from this generation and forever? How can I do that? Well, God knows how to do that. God's capable of doing that and we believe that he has done that and that's why we use the King James Bible only because it is the preserved word of God. God has preserved his word all the way up to 2016. And we have his word perfectly because he's completely capable of doing that. He's not limited by man's limitation. Now look, if it were just completely left up to man to do that, there probably would be mistakes. There probably would be errors. That's where that argument would make sense and say, yeah, of course. I mean, there's, there's too much involved here. There's too many ways for errors to pop up. But when God is involved, when God has his hand in it, no way. 
No way. And when he makes a promise, he comes through with it. Even when it's impossible. God promised unto Abraham he's going to have a son. Guess what? Even when it was impossible, he brought that son. God makes a promise he's going to preserve his word. Even if it has to go through multiple languages, even if it has to be copied and copied and copied. Guess what? He's going to come through with it. God's big enough to preserve our souls. You know, so many people today think you could lose your salvation. You know, once you put your faith in Christ, as if, as if the blood of Christ is enough to pay for your sins at that moment in time, and then later on, it's not sufficient because you've sinned again. No, our God is able to preserve not only His Word, but our souls. Our souls, our, our spirit is born again from His Word, from His preserved Word. We get a new spirit that is preserved through Christ. Jude 1, you know, Verse 1, the, the, our memory passage has Jude, the service of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ Jesus. He's preserved us. We are preserved in Him. He's the one preserving us. If it were left up to ourselves, again, we would fail. If I had to preserve my own salvation, my own good works, my own obedience to the law, whatever it may be, in order to keep my salvation and to stay going strong, I'm going to fail. Every time. But you know what? When God's involved, when God has saved my soul, when God has made a promise, when God says I have eternal life, He's going to come through with that. He's not going to break His promise. God's that big. Even if I screw up for the whole rest of my life and, and never do a thing for God. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. No good works. God is that big. God's big enough to create this world by the words of his mouth. Everything that exists, the entire creation, the universe, the stars, the planets, the world, all life, animals, everything, speak it into existence. And yeah, in seven literal days. Amen. Again, something that the world's going to say, well, that's impossible. There's no way all this stuff could come. So, you know, yet they believe in, in a big bang that happened in a moment that created everything. There's no way God created everything. And say, well, yeah, he can. Because God is that big. We don't need theistic evolution. We don't need, you know, the gap theory. We don't need any of this other nonsense in order to believe God's word. In order to know that when God says something, he comes through with it. And that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen. God's big enough to answer our prayers. Your number is 11. Not just our prayers, but any prayer, by the way. Don't think that... Now, now look, we pray for things. Oftentimes, all you need is a little. All you need is just, is just something real simple. Hey, bring that to God in prayer. Absolutely. Amen and amen. But don't forget that God is capable of doing the miraculous, the big, the huge. When, when, you, when you feel like you have a need, don't think, oh man, there's no way. You know, like, I don't know what I'm going to do and just give up and throw up your hands. Because God is capable of doing things. Look at Numbers 11. Now, this isn't the best uh, example for the people, but it's still a demonstration of God's power. Numbers chapter 11, verse 18. We'll start reading there. The Bible reads, And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. When the children of Israel were complaining, wandering in the wilderness, saying, Oh man, I remember the garlic, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and I remember all the stuff that we had in Egypt. Man, that was so good. And now we're left out in this, in this wilderness to eat this manna. And, and you know what? God is powerful enough to provide food for this huge multitude of people wandering out in the wilderness. Now, the people were, were unrighteous and, and were wicked in being, not being content with what God has provided for them. But there's a miracle all in and of itself that God created food to form on the plants that they just had to go out and pick and it's ready to eat. You don't have to do anything. Just go out there, collect it, and eat it. You don't have to work for it. All you have to do is just go out and take it. Just literally go outside and grab it. It was abundant everywhere to feed the entire multitude. So that nobody was, was lacking at all. 
That's a big God. But not only that, not only did he do that, look at what he does here. When they're complaining and they're saying, oh man, I wish we had some meat to eat. God says, okay. You want some meat to eat? You want some flesh? You, you, know, you, 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 you forget what it was like in Egypt already? I could do that. And look, and look at what happens here. Look at verse number um, 19. You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? See, this made God really angry to hear the complaining. And, you know, the sermon this morning isn't about complaining, but keep this in mind to be content with what you have. As, as, even though we know God's capable of anything, when you start complaining about what he's already given you and just think, oh man, if we just had this, you're going to watch out what you ask for in, you know, in, in certain cases, and this is one of them. You know, they, would, they should have just been happy with what they had. Now, and, and this is important. It ties in with, with this subject here of, of the prayer, with God being big enough to answer any prayer. You know, a bad prayer is saying, I want to be back in Egypt. Right? The bad prayer is, is, is asking for things and, and desiring and wanting and coveting things that, that you shouldn't be, be so concerned about and just being content with what you have already. Because that same big God that's capable of doing all these great things and amazing things and blessing people with children and bringing people back from dead and doing all this great, wonderful works, he's also capable of doing great things that are not going to be for your benefit. And this is what happens here. He says, you know what? Okay, you want some flesh? You're not going to eat for one day. And that's a big enough miracle as, as it is for that many people that were, that were come out of Egypt to eat, to eat flesh for one day. He says, but no, it's not going to be for one day. It's not going to be for two days. It's not going to be for a week. Not even for 20 days. It's going to be for an entire month. Entire month of meat. That's a lot of meat. That's a lot. It's so much that Moses even questions God. Well, say, what? Like 30 days? What are you talking about, God? Look at verse number um, 21. And Moses said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. I mean, think about 600,000 footmen. That's a lot. Of, I mean, over half a million people. And now I said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Is that like all the, all the herds, all the animals, everything that we have that's with us right now? Do we just have to just kill all of them in order to have this flesh for a month? Because Moses isn't thinking in God's terms. He's thinking in man's terms. He's saying, well, how are we going to do that? How is this going to be accomplished, God? He says, or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? He's like, do we just have to like get all the fish? I mean, this is a lot of people, over half a million people. Verse 23, and the Lord said unto Moses, and I love this, this, this uh, statement here by God, is the Lord's hand waxed short? Just like we saw in Genesis, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Does God have a short arm? Is God just not fully capable? Is he somehow impotent? Is he just not able to, to get things done that he says he's going to get done? He says, thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And this is the type of faith that we need to have. When God says something, no matter how impossible it may seem, we just need to receive it. We need to accept it. We need to just have faith. You know what? Hey, if God said it, I don't even know how it's going to happen. Moses had no clue how he's going to feed that many people for a month. But he should have just been like, all right, well, let's see what happens here. You know, like, let's see what you're going to do, God. We ought not to be at the point where we, we're questioning whether God's capable of doing the things that he says he's able to do. Look at verse 31. So now this is, this is where he's bringing the meat from. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. He brings in these birds, these quails. I mean, just imagine how many birds must have been flying over. God brings in, literally dumps it in their camp, three feet high. The bird is falling down on the ground, three feet high, and it says a day's journey 
just all around their camp. You start walking out of the camp, these birds are just piled up three feet high. That's a lot of birds. <laughs> that's a lot of meat. I mean, that's, that's a month's worth of food for 600,000 people. You got to walk for an entire day before you stop seeing, being surrounded by three feet high of, of, of birds. That's amazing. Verse 32, And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. God was still upset over it. I mean, he gave them, and, and what he was doing was he was demonstrating his power. Because the people had gotten too content, they'd gotten too comfortable, they'd gotten too, you know, despising of the things that they actually had that God had provided for them, and ignored the miracle of the manna, ignored that God was already providing for them, and complained about it, and God showed them what he's capable of doing before punishing them. What we need to take away from that in this sermon is what he's capable of doing. You know, they had a need. They, needed, they, wanted, they didn't even have a need there. They had a want. They had a desire. And you know what? God was able to fulfill that desire, but they, had, they went about it the wrong way because they weren't content with what they had. But God is able to, to answer anything, no matter how impossible it may seem. Our God is a God of miracles. Amen. Turn if you would to Matthew 14. Again, going back to another food illustration here in the New Testament with Jesus. The, when, where, where, he, where the famous chapter where he feeds the 5,000. And you could say, this is nothing. I mean, God, we just read a story where God fed 600,000 for a month, right? And this is, this is feeding 5,000 for one day. But this goes to show how God can miraculously provide even when you don't have much and your need is great. In this situation, Matthew 14, it really was a need. This wasn't just, oh man, we have this other food to sustain us, but we're just sick of it. We're, we're, we just despise it. We don't like it. We want something different on the menu. This is, they're out in the wilderness and they're, you know, they're in the desert and they're listening to Jesus preach and they've just been following him and listening to what he has to say. And they're hungry because they've been out all day and, you know, he didn't want to send them away hungry. Look at verse 14 of Matthew 14. The Bible reads, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, and again, another miracle, he healed their sick. People have diseases. And, you know, and there's so many examples for a sermon. I mean, it, you go on and on and on and on throughout the Bible of Jesus performing miracles demonstrating the power of God. He healed their sick. Let's keep reading here, verse 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals." But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them hither to me. Five loaves of bread and two fishes is what they had. That's what they had in store. They said, this is, this is all we got. Okay? And that might have been enough to, to go around among the 12, you know, to, to, to satisfy their, their need for food. I mean, that's not going to fill them up. Five loaves of bread and two fishes between, between 12 men, 12 grown men, you know, that's, that's still only going to go so far. But they say, well, this is what we got. Jesus He's like, you know what? Bring it to me. It says in verse 19, And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men beside women and children. Huge amount of people. What, what happened? They brought what they had to God. They brought it to Jesus. They said, this is what I got. God, I don't have much. And I need to survive. And, there, and, and we need to feed these people. And, and we have this need, God. God, please provide for us. And here's what I have. And you know what? They're willing to give, them, give it all to them. Here's everything we have. It's right here, God. 
Can you just make this work for us? And he does. And what's amazing here is that they, they bring back more than they even started with. They started with five loaves of bread. That's not you're not going to put five loaves of bread and two fishes into 12 baskets. He blessed so abundantly that they were able to come back with more than they started with. But what we can see here is, you know, you may have problems with, with your finances. You say, I don't know how we're going to survive. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to eat. I need to provide for my family. And look, if you're working, if you're doing what's right, you're following Jesus, you're with him, you're right there. You say, well, this is all we got, Jesus. What are you going to do? Can you help me out? God can provide. There's been times in my life where I just have to look back and I just kind of boggled like, you know, I, I kind of keep close track on my finances. And there's times we get through stuff and it's like, how did, how did we get through this? How, you know, it, it was just like, how did this even happen? And it's like, you look back, it's like, that's weird. I'm still making the same amount of money. It's not like, you know, and, and somehow God has just like spread out your, you know, your finances to just kind of work. And I believe God's able to, to, to do that and, and miraculously can continue to provide for you with what you have as long as you're willing to, to bring everything to him. God was able to, to give the children of Israel water out of the rock. Right? Another, another miraculous event. They were in need. They were thirsty. They like, God, we're going to die. We've been going now. We've been traveling for a couple days. We need to get some water out of a rock. I mean, it's the last place you're going to look for to get water, right? Oh, here's a rock on the ground. Let's see if there's any water in this rock. But that's where uh, you know, Moses was able to bring it out through the power of God and um, was able to satisfy that need as well. Turn, if you would, to... You're in Matthew 14. Just stay there because we're going to go to Matthew 13. I'm going to read for you from Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. It's, you know, it talks about Moses. It talks about Abraham. It talks about these great men of faith and all of the miraculous things that God did because they had faith. You know, Abraham offered up his son Isaac and was willing to put him to death. You know, again, the same Isaac that was a miracle just in giving him that birth in his old age already and God said, you know what, you know, go up and, and offer up Isaac unto me. But Abraham had the faith that God was able to raise him even from the dead. He knew because at that point he's like, you know what, I'm not going to doubt God's word. I've seen the miracles. I'm not going to doubt anything that he's capable of doing. He's already given me this child. He said, well, if he's telling me to do it, then you know what? He's already made a promise unto me, and I know he has to keep that promise, so I'm just going to do this because even if I have to kill him, God's able to raise him back up from the dead. And that's the faith that he had. And uh, the Bible, I'm just going to read the summary at the end of the, near the end of the chapter. You know, after they go through the, the, the kind of the main characters of the Bible, uh, Hebrews 11.32 reads, And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms. Subdued kingdoms. That means they, they brought into subjection other kingdoms. They defeated kingdoms. Wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Remember Daniel and the lions then? quenched the violence of fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, made the, 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 uh, the in invading armies turn around and run away. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And it goes on and on. But we see here, the great miracles. It's a, a brief summary of some of the miracles that God has been performing throughout time. And all of it, though, what it all boils down to is that these people all had faith. We serve a big God. Our God is a very big God. But without faith, you can't expect to see the big miracles happen. You have to do something. You have to take the actions of faith in order to see God's strong arm and his outstretched arm do the things that he's going to do. There has to be something on our end where we're willing to step out and walk 
in faith. You're in Ma turn up, uh, to Matthew 13. I had you in Matthew 14. Matthew 13, verse 57, right there at the end of the, at the, end of the chapter. The Bible reads, And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So in Jesus' ministry, he's going around, he's healing people, you know, he's performing these miracles. But then he gets, he gets back to his hometown. And look, I'm like, like, who's this? Oh, is this Mary's son? Is this jo you know, the son of the carpenter? We know him. We know his brother. You know, like, like, who is he? And they didn't, they didn't have faith. They didn't believe. So he's like, okay, well, I'm not going to do any, any big works there. And you'd think, you know, a lot of people might think the opposite. It's like, well, if they don't believe, then why don't you do more miracles, right? And he says, no, 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 no. That's not the way I operate. You want to see big things done? Believe me first. Believe my word. Amen. Then we're going to see the big, the big things come. Then we're going to see the miracles happen. But you just better first start off before you've got your eyes set on all these great big miracles. Start off just believing in me. Just believe what I say. And then I'm going to show you some great things. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Turn if you would to Mark 11. Mark 9, 23 says, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And that's, of course, the man that had his, his child that was possessed of a devil. And the, and the disciples weren't able to cast him out. He's saying, look, you know, all you got to do is believe. He says, anything is possible unto you. All now look, it's a silly rhetorical question, but who, I mean, nobody thinks in this room that Jesus doesn't keep his promises. That when Jesus says something, oh, he didn't really mean that. He says here, if you believe, he says, all things are possible. All things. We're going to see another statement here in Mark chapter 11. All things are possible. Keep that in mind. Don't ever think you're in an impossible situation. All things are possible to him that believeth. Look at uh, verse 22 of Mark 11. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Faith is the key to our prayer life. Faith is the key to God answering your prayers and to doing the great miracles that you need in your life. God is capable of doing anything. Now, if God is big enough to give you the power to literally remove mountains, and you know, this isn't just Jesus being, you know, kind of using fantastic speech. I believe this to be 100% true. Why would I doubt that? That if I, if, if I believe and didn't doubt that I could, re, I could move mountains by, through the power of God, by asking God if, if there was a need for that and, and it needed to happen, God can completely do that. An entire mountain. I mean, we live with mountains all around us. They're huge. I mean, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's unimaginable almost, but... I mean, hey, this is the same God that was able to, to bring the dial back in the, in the, you know, the sundial back 10 degrees, right? Which was able to reverse time for, for like, miraculously to just, oh, yeah, here's the sun. Yeah, we're going to bring it back. We're going backwards in time for, for a little bit. God's capable of doing that. God's capable of doing anything. And if God's big enough to empower you to, re to remove mountains, I mean, literally, to do that type of work, is he big enough to provide for you to, say, move to a good church? And I'll tell you what, I've been encouraged because we've had one family already move out here and we've got another one already on the way, has already stepped out in faith. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of difficulties. There's been a lot of problems. There's, you know, it's not the easy road necessarily, but when you look back, you're going to see, hey, God led me all the way. God provided every step of the way. And it might be scary, but you have to remember who you serve. You say, you know what, I'm doing what's right. I'm doing what God has for me. 
It may be a little scary. I don't know where I'm going to work. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to step, I'm going to take an action in faith and know that God will take care of me. I know that God's not going to let me starve. Hey, if I'm doing what's right, if I'm going to go to grow, to learn more, to do some soul winning, to just, just really grow spiritually, and I need to go to a place in order to do that because there's nowhere for me to get that done where I'm living right now. If you choose to do that, God's not going to let you starve. He's not. It's not going to happen. He's already promised to feed you and to clothe you. Now, you may not have all the comfort and the riches and the cars and the nice house and everything else that you may have right now. You might not have all that stuff. You might end up losing some of that stuff. I'm being real. But if you're scared about what's going to happen, you don't have to be. Because God's already made the promise in his word and he can't go back on it that you will be fed and you will be clothed and he is going to look out for you. And I think God's going to go beyond that anyways. I think he'll bless you for making that type of an of a, of a action of stepping out in faith. Amen. Turn if you go to James chapter 5. This isn't just rhetoric. I don't just believe that the Bible, you know, like this head belief of just saying, oh yeah, well, yeah, that happened. God's capable of doing those things and leave it at that. It needs to be transformed into your life. That faith of just going from saying, oh wow, that's amazing. Look at these things that happen as if this is just a history book and those things are just in the past. God is alive today. God is the same God that he was all throughout history. God's power hasn't changed. People haven't changed. We're still men. The, you know, the, the men of the Bible, the men that we read about, were like men like us. I mean, they had desires. They have the flesh. They have a desire to sin. They also have a spirit, you know, that's willing to, 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 to do right. They have the same, you know, the same things that we have today. I mean, not the same technology, but who cares? That's not, that has nothing to do with your soul. With, with human nature. Look at James chapter 5, verse 14. We're going to see some more power of God that is power that is available to us today. Today, in 2016. This God's power is available to us today here in James chapter 5. Look at verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we see here the, the example of Elijah says, Elias was a, a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Talk about power. The power in that prayer is the power of God, the almighty, powerful God, when one man says, God... Stop the rain for three and a half years. Stop the rain, God. And God listens to that person and says, okay. Okay, no more. You say, but I know science. I, mean, I understand it. the water evaporates and it goes in the clouds. And there we go. Like, like it has to happen. When God says no, no, it doesn't. Right. I mean, there's so many things that, that you can't explain the, the miracles of God with science. We have to just believe that, it, that he, he's capable of doing these things. And then it says, and he prayed again. God, you know, okay, bring the rain now. And he didn't. And the, the key here, though, is in verse 16. It says, the effectual, having an effect, the effectual fervent prayer. Fervent is, I mean, you are actively, seriously praying unto God. This isn't just a, God bless the food of my body. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not a prayer. That's not, that's not a fervent, effectual prayer unto God. It isn't just a routine. When you have a need, when you have a problem, when you go to God in prayer, 
And you have effectual, fervent prayer, it says, and look at this, of a righteous man. You've already been listening to God. You've been listening to what He has for you when He's saying, okay, son, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, and you, you're doing that. And now look, I know none of us are perfect, but the Bible talks about this over and over and over again about people being righteous. There is a level of righteousness that you can have in your life where you are generally following God and adhering to His law. You know, obviously without complete sinless perfection. But there's a huge difference between someone who is you know, following the vast majority of the laws and doing what's right and someone who's just out and being rebellious and doing whatever they want. I mean, there's a huge difference there. You want God to answer your prayer. You want to see the power of God. Do you want God to answer those miraculous things, that, those needs that you have? I mean, the serious problems. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You're not just speaking into the air. You're not, it's, not, it's not just, you know, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. And look, if you pray and doubt, he's not going to answer your prayer. He's saying, look, you need to, when you ask for things, you need to believe. You need to have a faith and say, I know that you're capable of doing this, God. And God, I'm trusting in you. Look, I'm doing, and, and what, that's the type of confidence you need. When you're a righteous man, you can have that confidence. You don't need to worry about it because you're saying, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, God. There's no reason for you not to answer my prayer. It's according to your will. It's what you want me to do. Help me out here, God. I need your help. I have no idea how, it's, how this could even be solved, how my problem can be fixed, God. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to trust you to take care of it. And God will do that. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Turn back, if you would, to 1 Samuel 17. You see one more example in the Bible. You say, but you don't know how big my problems are. A lot of people get too caught up looking at the size of the problem that they have and getting discouraged and, and, and feeling defeated before they even get started because the problem just seems too big, insurmountable, and, and, and not able to... to um, to face it, 1 Samuel 17, I know my girls are going to love this. Listen up, girls. This is our favorite story in the Bible. 1 Samuel 17 is a, is a story of David and Goliath. <clears throat> and we see a great example here. <clears throat> of someone who is facing, literally, a huge problem. <laughs> a huge, gigantic problem. A life or death problem. We go through a lot of problems in this life, and think about it. How many of the problems that you really stress over and really and really just gain your attention and and and, and you know cause you to have a lot of grief over are a life and death problem? Not very many, right? I mean, there may be one you know that that happens sometimes, but this is a big problem that David is facing. This is. This is a big obstacle. This is a challenge. It's not comfortable. It's something that he's facing that... Um, here, well, we'll start reading. It's a real familiar story. We're going to jump around a little bit. I'm not going to read all of it. But let's start reading in verse number 3. It says, And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. It's a giant, really tall guy. Now, a cubit is roughly about a foot and a half. So that's nine feet just in cubits, and then he's also a span above that. Okay, so like 12 feet, somewhere in that vicinity, 10, 12 feet, whatever, you know, you, you, you come up with it. That's a, that's a big guy. That's a big dude. Not only is he tall, he's not like tall and lanky. He's a warrior. I mean, he's a, he's a big dude. Now, I've seen some big guys... Like in person, you know, some professional football players and some guys are just like, I mean, big guys, right? Like 6'8", six, 6'10", six, and just, you know, a few hundred pounds. Those guys look like giants. But this guy, I mean, about twice that big. Huge. Let's keep reading here. Verse 5. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. 
and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. He's decked out, man. He has got the armor. Not only is he big and he's strong and he's got these weapons that only a giant can use because they're, they're so big and could cause such destruction, he's got the defense too. He's wearing armor. He's got the greaves. I mean, he's got his shins protected. He's got his legs protected. He's got his chest protected. A seemingly impenetrable force. And in the story, he keeps presenting himself. And bringing up, you know, just, just putting it in the face of the children of Israel. Hey, hey, who's man enough to come fight me? You know, come on, bring it on. We'll settle this whole war right now, me and you. Bring it on. Representing the devil and Satan just, just bringing out, you know, this attack. And everyone else was cowering in fear. Because they were looking at the flesh. They were looking at, how can we do this? In your own power, you can't. It's an impossible situation. David is faced with an impossible situation. This guy is way, way, way too strong. Look at verse 33. We're going to jump down to verse 33 here in 1 Samuel 17. Because we're going to see Saul then talking to David, saying, like, well, wait a minute. how?" Because you know, David says, hey, I'm going to go get him. I'm going to go kill him. You know, send me. I'll go take care of this guy. This uncircumcised Philistine. Who does he think he is? Mocking God. I'll take care of him right now. He had great attitude. He was ready to go. Verse 33 says, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this, this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. I mean, Goliath was trained and taught as a child to be a great warrior. He's like, he's been in battles. He's a veteran. He's got all this experience. You can't fight him. He's like, you're just a youth. I mean, he's a hardened warrior. How, how in the world do you think that you could fight Goliath? David said unto Saul, verse 34, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So he tells him this story. He's like, look, I killed a lion and a bear. I was out, I was out being a shepherd boy watching the sheep. This lion and this bear came. I killed them both. But what's great about David's attitude here, we're going to see this in the next verse, he understands how it all got done. It wasn't his own might. wasn't his own strength. He had already experienced the power of God in his life, and that emboldened him to do even greater things. Take a look back at the things that God's already done in your life. I mean, hopefully everybody in this room this morning is saved. God's already saved you from the sin that's going to send you to hell. That's a great accomplishment. Don't get so used to that and take it for granted as if it's nothing. That alone is miraculous. That, that Jesus Christ's atonement, His blood being shed, can be applied to you. And the free gift is given. But I'm sure that if you think back, there's probably many other instances in your life where God has helped you out and has done great things. David uses this example of what he's done in the past now to, to battle even bigger things and to have more courage and have more faith. Look at verse 37. It says, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. And you know what? Good on Saul for, for seeing that, the power of God and recognizing that. Because David gave the credit where credit was due. He says, look, I was out watching the sheep. Lion and bear came. I killed them. But that God delivered me out of their hand. God's the one that won that victory for me. God was with me. God allowed me to kill those animals. And you know what? That same God, he's going to be with me today too. Amen. He was unwavering. He was not doubting. He says, God is with me. 
Now, he was relying on God. He had to pray to God, God, help me to kill this Philistine. Help me to kill Goliath. I can't do it on my own. But he was confident in his prayer and in his request to go to God to say, hey, you know what? God's going to do this. Don't even know how. I'm going to go out there with the best that I got. He goes out there with, with a few stones and a sling. That's all I know how to do. But here's what I got, God. I'm giving it to you, just like the, the, the five loaves and the, and, the, and the two fishes. This is what I got, God. You do the rest. Let's jump down to verse 42. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Again, it's a scary situation. I mean, he's, he's just railing on them and saying, You know, who is this, this child? What do you, you, you despise me? You think I'm nothing? You're just going to send some child out to fight me? And put yourself in that situation. That's a very scary situation to be in. That's a big obstacle that you're facing. Impossible situation. We need to have the attitude of David. Look at verse 45. None of that phased him. None of the verbal attacks. None of the, the physical appearance. Verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. God loves people like David that are willing to stand up and say, God, use me to do a great work. It's not in my power, God. You're going to get all the glory for this. God loves getting that glory for his name. He loves it. He's looking for people that are willing to step out in faith to show his awesome power, to show his great works. And all throughout this, David is not ever claiming any credit for strength and power and might that he's going to go out he's trained better and i know uh brazilian jiu-jitsu and i'm going to take this guy down i don't care how big he is you know whatever it is he's not trusting in his own flesh and in his own might he's saying you know what god's gonna get this victory for me i know what i know you know i know the things whatever i've been taught whatever i've learned and that i'm going to take all of that and i'm going to use it but god needs help me with this because this is beyond what i can what, what i can handle verse number 47 and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Man, you got to love that courage. You got to love that faith that he didn't fear at all. Not only, you know, he's faced with this guy and he starts coming after him. He ran. I mean, he, but he's just going, you know what? I've got this. God's got this. He is excited. He hasted. He didn't say, okay, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure about this. I don't know. He ran. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't, they didn't have to wait and think, you know, when they were confronted with, hey, you're, okay, I'm going to play the music for you one more time. You're going to bow down. If you don't bow down, I'm going to, I'm going to toss you into this, into this burning, fiery furnace. And they said, you know what? We don't even have, have to stop and think about that. He said, Yo, he's, like, he's like, I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'll give you 10 minutes. You make up your mind. We, we don't need the 10 minutes. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. We already know. Hey, look, we're not going to bow down to your stupid statue. If God, if God wants to, hey, he is completely capable of saving us. We trust in God. God can save us from this. You know, and if he doesn't, Okay, either way, we're not breaking his commandments. We're not, we're not, we're not you know, disobeying that. We're not going to bow down to your false god, to your idol. And of course, we know God did save them from that. God loves that attitude. And they had confidence too. I mean, they didn't, we never know in any specific situation where God's going to step in and where he's not. Because as I mentioned in the announcements this morning, God may allow for a good, righteous man to be killed as a martyr 
and you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have still brought great glory unto God's name just by not bowing down as the only people who weren't bowing down. I mean, right alone, right there, just being martyred is a really big statement, and God might have wanted that, you know, obviously it's not what he wanted. He wanted to save them and brought even more honor and everything, but, but that could have been their fate. And they, were, and they were righteous, and they would have been right, just as I mentioned with Stephen the martyr. You know, God allowed him to be, for his life to be taken, but he was doing what was right. But they had complete confidence and faith that God is able to, to deliver them. Just as we need to have the confidence and faith that God can answer our prayers, <clears throat> there's no need to worry about how big your problems are. In fact, the bigger the problem, the more likely it is that God is going to step in on your behalf if you can't handle it because that's going to give him that much more honor and that much more glory. Never forget how big your God is. Not only how big he is, but how big he can be with your faith. That is, that is the key. All you need to do is have the faith. It's easy to get caught up in the moment, to get overwhelmed, to feel burnt out when everything looks impossible. But we need to keep that faith in God and know that when you're doing what's right, He'll be there for you and can deliver you out of anything and is, and is just as powerful. You keep reading your Bible and you read all these great stories, God can do those things today. There's nothing holding Him back but ourselves. We're the ones holding Him back. That's it. Paul Rides, I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that uh, you hear us. God, that um, <clears throat> we're so thankful that we have such a powerful, almighty God to serve, dear Lord. We pray that you would please help us to realize um, when we read Scripture and we read these things that we don't just read over them but that we understand the reality of, of the things that you have done and the things that you're still capable of today. Lord, help us to get over ourselves when we have our issues and our problems and we start getting stressed out to be able to turn to you with confidence and, and, and help us to just be a little bit more emboldened, dear Lord. Help us to be mindful of the areas where you've already worked in our lives to give us the encouragement and the strength going forward so that we wouldn't doubt, that we wouldn't be wavering, but that we could come to you with all boldness and confidence with our requests and our desires, dear Lord. And we love you. We thank you. We pray that you would please just use us mightily to, to do great works in your name, dear God. We pray for your power upon us. To, to perform the, the impossible, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.